when we're looking at our phase change diagram, we can see in sections A, C, and E that we have temperature changes going on. So in section A, uh, your substance is a solid the whole time. It's just the temperature of that solid is changing. And C is liquid the whole time. It's just you're starting off with a cold liquid and ended up with a hot liquid. And up here uh, in E, it's a gas the whole time. It's just the temperature of that gas is changing. When you're in sections B and D, there is no temperature change. This guy's holding steady at what we call the melting point of the substance. And during section D of the graph, also holding steady at the substance's boiling point. So that heat needed to melt something or given off as that heat um, if an object is freezing, is called its heat of fusion. It says here it's the heat required to melt something or the heat given off as it freezes. So, so far when we've been looking at this graph, we've been thinking about it from the perspective of moving from the left-hand side to the right-hand side, like we're climbing up the graph and it's getting hotter. Now, if I were to kind of draw some lines down here and here, and we looked at the temperature, excuse me, the uh, energy change that happens between these two points. If we're going from left to right, we'd have to put energy in as we go this direction supply energy, but if we went the other direction from right to left, wouldn't the delta Q, this number, be the exact same? It would just be that you're releasing energy instead of absorbing energy. So the value is the same, it's just the signage that would be uh, different. So that's why it says here um, the heat needed to melt something or the heat given off. It's the same value. It's just positive if you're melting, negative if you're freezing. If you're trying to get something to boil, the amount of heat needed to make that happen, we call that heat of vaporization. And it says here, um, it's the amount of heat to boil something or condense for the same reasons as above. If we kind of uh, extend this line down here and here, and if we imagine in our minds going from left to right across this bar, if you go from left to right, your Q is increasing, so your delta Q would be a positive number. If you were going from right to left instead, headed this direction, the same, it's the same value for delta Q, it would just be negative, you're releasing that energy. So some helpful information to know off the top of your head is a little bit about water. So ice, solid water, exists from rain, temperature ranges up to zero degrees Celsius. Now, you don't have to memorize this because it is on your chart right here that it tells us the melting point of water. Um, but just kind of handy. So if, uh, and then liquid water exists from zero degrees Celsius all the way up to 100. And then 100 degrees plus is where uh, steam starts to kick in. So notice that if I just said that you have water at zero degrees, you could have water at zero degrees and have it be all solid. You could have it as all liquid because water's melting point is zero degrees Celsius and both states of matter exist. So you would need a little bit more information. You couldn't just say zero degrees and that's all. 
both states of matter exist at zero, both liquid and gaseous states exist at 100. So if we want to get something to melt or freeze, there's those equations we had talked about on the previous page. So what if we wanted to get 10 grams of ice, turn it into 10 grams of liquid water, and keep it at zero degrees the whole time? Just melt it, no temperature changes. So we're basically looking at section B of that graph. So there is no delta T in section B of the graph. So we're going to use that heat of fusion equation here to help us solve. So I know the mass of my ice cube is 10 grams. And now I need the heat of fusion for ice, water. So you go to your chart and find ice's heat of fusion number. Water's heat of fusion is this number right here, that 335 joules per gram. Notice how those units are a little bit different than a specific heat, which is joules per gram degree C. The units are different because when you're talking specific heat, when you're doing an MC delta T equation, there are temperature changes, so we need Celsius factored in. Here, we don't have any temperature changes, so there's no need to factor in that Celsius. Uh, if we multiply 10 by 335, we'd get 3,350 joules. Now is the point where we'd sig fig round, and this one is kind of a crude measurement because we just have one sig fig in that mass, the 10. So I only get to keep one sig fig here. So I would round that to ballpark 3,000 joules. What if we wanted to take 10 grams of liquid water and turn it into steam at 100 degrees? So this time, we're no temperature changes. It's staying 100 degrees the whole time. Just get it from 100 degree liquid to 100 degree gas. So we're at part D on that graph. We're going to use the mass times heat of vaporization this time. So still 10 grams, but now we need water's heat of vaporization number. So we go to our chart. Here's the number right here, 2,260 joules per gram. So our Q would be 22,600 joules. Once again, kind of a crude uh, mass there just says 10 grams with one sig fig, so I get to keep one sig fig. So it takes roughly 20,000 joules to get that 10 grams of water to boil. And it does point out to you here, it says, notice it takes a lot more heat to evaporate, boil something, than it does to get something to melt. 20,000 joules versus 3,000 joules. And that's why that D line is wider. It would be as if we labeled this little section here um, from here to here are 20,000 joules, whereas our orange section over here, section B, only takes 3,000 joules to go from here to here, 20,000 to go from here to here. So that section is wider on the graph.